Good morning. We want to welcome you again uh, back with us as we continue in our series of John chapter 17. We've been in this chapter for a year and nine months, and we are going to continue again, even though it's Easter Sunday. And so um, if you have your Bibles, you can open them up to John chapter 17, verses 11 through 15. Now you're going to wonder why I'm taking this whole passage, but we're on the way out of this passage, and this morning's message will be part one. Next Sunday will be part two, and then we'll move on to verse 16. So follow with me as I read John 17. I'm reading out of the NIV version, and we're going to look at the whole paragraph now that we've been working through for the last couple of months, beginning at verse 11. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name that you gave me. None has been lost but the one doomed to destruction, so that scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full assurance of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, but they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Let's pray. Father, again, we come before you and we request that, uh, as always, that the Holy Spirit, who ultimately is our real teacher, would take this text that he penned through the Apostle John and that he would illuminate it for us this morning, that he would take it and make it really simple to understand, uh, that he would move in a special way and demonstrate his power by applying it to our lives individually and collectively. Above all, Father, we pray that you would be blessed and praised this morning and glorified and that your son would be glorified and that the Holy Spirit would be glorified in an incredible plan before the world was created that you instituted. So we ask all of these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Well, this morning, I want to start out by having a question for you. Have you ever wondered or ever reflected on how our culture and the thinking of our culture um, looks at today, Easter Sunday? Probably the most incredible day in human history, and yet when you take a look at our culture today, it's diminished. And people are not looking at Easter Sunday that way. You look at the public school system, and it's no longer called Easter break. It's called spring break. You take a look at our culture, and it's about the bunny, not about the birth of a Savior that was born to die for you and I. It's about the chocolate bunny and the sweets, not about the gruesome criminal death at a place called Golgotha, that our Savior, the very Son of God, had to die. In my conclusion, when you look at it academically, it's about the result of a secular worldview. And by that, I mean a worldview the way we see things in which man is at the center and God is pushed out. It's about that secular worldview that is the dominating worldview in our society today, in our politics today, in the educational system today, in our family today. It's that worldview that dominates everything, including Easter Sunday. And that's going to lead us to our theme this morning. It's Christ, the World, and the Devil, Part 1. Next Sunday, we'll handle the second part, part two. So let me review, if you're here this morning and catching us for the first time. We've been in John chapter 17 almost two years. 
We are currently addressing these verses 11 through 15. The background to John 17 is this. It's a prayer, but the prayer is audible by Christ. He's not praying silently. He's praying audibly. Now, why would somebody pray audibly? So that his audience would hear. His audience was the 12. So here you have the Son of God praying audibly so the disciples would be able to hear what he's saying. And for you and I, so that the gospel writer John could pen him for you and I later, and he's facing the shadow of the cross. This is going to come up in a couple of days. Now, when you look at the details of this, that's the broad view. You look at the immediate details and you see some specifics in these verses that I read. Still not on the outline yet. I'm just giving you an intro. First, he uses the word world in every verse. And that word, which we'll look at later, there are three Greek words for it. And so we're going to eliminate two, so you're going to understand exactly what he means when he says the world. And, and I'll give you one tip. It's not the universe. And then there's a concern by the Lord for the 12. That's why he's praying for them. You can understand by implication, if he's doing that before he's going to the cross, he's got a big concern. And then we see that he uses two key words, and we looked at them two Sundays ago. One is the word kept. Remember what that was? We talked about it. That word means a shepherd's care. It's a broad word that handles a lot of things, like taking care of the flock that a shepherd does, making sure he guides them, making sure he feeds them. It's dealing with those elements. And then the second word, your Bible may say guarded. Uh, the NIV says protected. That is in reference to attack. So catch this now. Jesus is saying that he's had his folks under a shepherd's care himself. And a shepherd that has sheep is constantly watching them. And he's constantly ready for an attack so he can protect them. He says that he did that. And then we see the underlying push behind his concern is his arch enemy, Satan. And Satan's influence behind, you ready? A secular world view. So what are you saying, Pastor Ananias? Are you saying that the secular world view today has its origin and it's pushed by the very enemy of God? Exactly. It's exactly it. In education, in politics, in every facet of life. That's what a worldview is, how we look at life and how we run it through a system. And that secular worldview is anti-Bible, anti-Christ, anti-God. And guess what? We're already there. That's a picture of our society. The second thing that we notice in this is there's a plea, a plea by Christ or a requ request in this prayer. And we see it in verse 12, so let me read it for you. Again, just setting the stage of the outline that we're going to come to. Verse 12, it says, While I was with them, I, here's the one verb, protected them. And here's the second word, verb, I kept them safe. So Christ is praying to the Father, telling them, I kept them, I protected them, and now, Dad, I need you to do that. Why? Because he's about to face the trial of the cross and death. And he has a concern about his disciples. Now, if you have your outline, let's take a look at the introductory comments that you have as a preliminary info item to Roman numeral 1, 2, 3, and 4. So here we go under introductory comments. Number one, the concern of the Christian and his or her life in the world. That's basically the gist of this prayer from Christ, and it's one that you and I should hook up on. 
if Christ has a concern about the Christian in this world, we, being the Christian, should also. Our example that we're going to take, not only from John 17, which we're going to work through, but Acts chapter 20. You don't need to turn there, just jot it down. Let me give you the backdrop to that. You have it in your uh, introductory comments um, under A1. Paul had the same concern about the people in the church at Ephesus and us. I give it to you again. Under Acts 20, you have Paul had the same concern about the people in the church at Ephesus and us, Christians that would follow. Well, let me give you the backdrop of Acts 20. Here's the thing. Paul's hurrying up to go to Jerusalem. He knows what's waiting for him, chains. And now that he's getting ready to leave, he knows that he's never going to see these folks at Ephesus again. Why are they so special? He discipled them. He taught them. And so now what Paul is getting ready to do, he sends a message to the elders and said, hey, let's meet at the beach on my way to Jerusalem. Why? He had a burden for them. He had a concern for them. Well, that sounds exactly like John 17. It is. Paul wanted to warn them about certain things. And you find this in Acts 20 if you read the chapter. What's the first thing he's warning them? Ready? Wolves that are going to attack from the outside. That's what he wants to warn them about. You're going to have an attack. It's going to come from the outside. Behind the attack is going to be Satan. And these are going to be individuals, wolves that are going to come in and want to tear up the church. And then he warns them about, guess what? You got some problems inside. They're already there. So be heads up. And then the last thing that he does in Acts chapter 20, he ends up praying, committing them to God. And what does that sound like? That just sounds like what we read. That's exactly what Christ is doing in this prayer he commits them to the Father while he gets ready to go to the cross. The message for you and I, that's what we want to pull apart from this. So here we go. Christ, the world, and the devil. Roman numeral number one. The life of the Christian in this world is a life of conflict. Please note that. The life of the Christian in this world is a life of conflict. If you're a Christian, expect it. Don't be shocked by it. Expect it, because that's our life, a life of conflict. And we're going to look at why. Under letter A, Christians are in the midst. Christians are in the midst of a tremendous spiritual battle. Christians are in the midst of a tremendous spiritual battle. The proof text for this, and you have it in your outline, is Ephesians chapter 6. I know you all know this really, really well. We're going to pull it apart a little bit. Ephesians 6 and three verses. So you're going to write down three verses in your blank after the chapter. Chapter 6, first verse, verse 11. And watch how Paul words it. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. So the first thing that Paul exhorts them to do is put on the full armor of God. You don't put on armor unless you expect to fight. And the fighting is in the spiritual realm. But there is some armor that Christians need to be aware of, need to know how to use it, need to put it on. So that's the first step. We see that it's for a battle. There's one there. Second, verse 13 is the second verse you want to jot down in that blank. And let me read that. 
verse 13 says, therefore put on the full armor of God. Two times now he says it. Why, Paul? So that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. So that's what he's saying. You put it on. You be ready for the fight. So what? So you're not thrown around the place. So you're able to take the hits, keep the ground that you're on, and keep the line, if you will, instead of retreating. And then the last verse that he gives is verse 12 that we're looking at, which is one verse up. And verse 12 says, for our struggle, here we go again, our fight, our battle, that's the idea, is not against flesh and blood. Well, what's that mean? In other words, not human. Our battle is not with human beings, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Well, that's a lot. And what he's saying in verse 12, he gives the reason, which you see it in your Bible may say for, in verse 12, uh, that's in the Greek. It means they're given a reason for this. So he's saying, here's the reason. We don't wrestle against humans. We wrestle against spiritual forces of darkness. And Paul listens. Well, don't humans, but we're in a physical realm. That's right. Humans can be used by Satan. They become the tools of Satan. They promote his agenda. But the real battle is in the other realm, the other kingdom, that is more real, Paul said, than the very one we're living in right now. And this is interesting teaching when you think about it because it exposes that there is a tension for every Christian. Now, that's interesting. That every believer that has a personal relationship with Christ, there's a tension going on. There's a battle going on. It never stops. And every Christian should be aware of it. I'm wondering whether we are. That's the real question. That most, I believe, are unaware of it. Oh, yeah, we'll throw it out there. But on a day-to-day -day basis, they don't see the battle. And yet the word says it's a daily thing. The verbs are present tense. That means that it's ongoing, that, it, that we have it. It's there, and we better be aware of it. Otherwise... We will be pimped all day long. Maybe that's the reason why the church isn't as powerful as it should be. I don't know. Well, let's look at letter B. The world is the scene of the great battle. The world is the scene of the great battle that is going on between these rival spiritual forces and the Christian who belongs to Christ. I give it to you again. I'll go slow. If you want it again, raise up a hand and slow it down. I, I need you to get it. I don't care what it looks like, okay? Uh, we want to get the content so we can apply it, so we can do battle. So here we go. Let her be again. The world is the scene. It's like a play, like going to the movie, if you will, of the great battle that is going on between... The rival spiritual forces, and Paul listed them in Ephesians 6, and the Christian who belongs to Christ. So the line is drawn, the battle is on. The very fact that we belong to Christ, the very fact that, <laughs> that you and I are Christians, means that we are immediately special targets. You know what it's sort of like? It's like... Being in L.A. And, it being, and, and, and being down in the hood, and you're in crypt territory, and you're a blood. The target is on your back. Now let's bring it to you and I. We're in Satan's world. He's the god of this world. It's his worldview that dominates. And guess what? 
we're in it. So the target is on our back. And the target comes through people. So if you're in a classroom and you're in high school and you're a Christian and the teacher is not, you're a target. If you're at a university level, you best believe you will be a target and it will affect your grade, especially when the worldview is one that is secular, anti-Bible, anti-Christian, anti-God. You will be a target. I've seen too many students talk to me about it that are believers. And so we become the enemy to them, if you will. So it means that these spiritual forces that Paul refers to are going to come for us. And they're going to use all the tricks they got. So it behooves you and I to be ready because they hate God. They hate Christ. And the moment we belong to Christ, then the enemy attacks you and I. You know, one thing I always found interesting. Have you ever noticed that when people get upset, they always go, Jesus Christ this, Jesus Christ that. You ever notice that? I've never once heard anybody say, even from Arab countries, Muhammad this, Muhammad that, Buddha this, Buddha that. Never do that. What? That's really intriguing to me. I wonder how that happens. But the enemy begins his attack on us, and this is what I want you and I to see. Not because he's interested in us. He is not. It's because his one overriding ambition is to mar and destroy God's perfect work. That's his goal. You and I, we're pawns in it to him. He could care less about us. What his concern is, he wants to mess up and destroy and mar God's perfect work. And guess who that entails, if you're a believer? You. Me. So our Lord knew this, and he prayed for it. Paul in Acts 20 knew it, and he prayed for his disciples. And guess who else? And I like this guy. Peter knew it. Peter had something to say about this. Let's look at it in 1 Peter 5, verse 8. 1 Peter 5, verse 8. Now, you know, one guy that would probably want a battle would be this guy. He had a short fuse. We see that. But look what he says in verse 8 about this tension, this battle that Paul referred to, that Jesus referred to. Look how Peter states it in verse 8. Be self-controlled and alert. In other words, be heads up, be self-controlled, you know, watch what's happening. Then he goes on, your enemy, ah, okay, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So that's the picture that Peter paints, that the enemy is prowling around like a roaring lion. He's looking for somebody that is a believer. And so what you and I need to do, we need to be heads up because there's a need for protection. That's what Jesus prayed for. I guarded them. I protected them. I kept them. So here's a thought. Every Christian, that's me and you now, we should be aware so that we start to look out for this. We start to be heads up for it. And many of us, I feel like we, we, we don't put our finger on it, but we go, man, it's a struggle today. It was a battle today. But we don't articulate it in any detail. And guess what? You're right. The Bible says you're exactly right. Life is a what? Conflict. The big question that I think you and I need to look at is one, whether we are conscious of our position as believers and our condition as Christians. Are we aware of it? 
whether we are conscious of the need that we need to be protected and we need to be kept. Whether we are aware of the spiritual conflict that takes place in which you and I are involved in it. I know a lot of Christians who are not aware of it. In fact, I'm going to go this far and say, I bet you 90% don't even catch it. Don't even catch it. They're not aware. Now, you talk to them about this, and then they think you're nuts. Uh-oh, Pastor Ananias has lost uh, a screw here, talking about warfare. And that's why I'm thinking that most believers don't catch it. One of the most interesting ways of measuring our spiritual understanding and insight is to discover the degree to which we are aware of the fight. Let me repeat that. One of the most interesting ways of measuring our spiritual understanding and our spiritual insight is to discover to the degree to which we are aware of this fight. Are we aware of a conflict? Are we aware of the position in which we are confronted in this evil world? To that extent, to the extent that we are not aware of it and the need for protection, to that extent, it demonstrates we're babies. So think about it. You got a lot of Christians going every day, and they don't give a thought to warfare at all. And they probably have a lack of understanding. That's why we're going to, after we're done with part one and part two, we're going to look at Satan's kingdom. We're going to look at his four major character traits. We're going to look at what he uses to attack us. We're going to look at how we attack the mind, and we're going to look at how do we develop a biblical mind to fight back. We're going to get very detailed in this warfare. Now, I venture to say most believers are unaware of it. So can you imagine being in a battle and being unaware of it? It's like going to a movie and watching, you know, a, a army flick, and you see guys just walking around while guns are shooting and, and tanks are going, and they're just walking through the war and not realizing that they're in a battle. And it sounds sort of funny, but that's the way most Christians are. And if we're like that, it's going to hurt. In fact, I think, have you ever seen babies? They, they are like what I just said. They're like the guy walking in a war and doesn't realize there's a war and everything's shooting. They just walk, and they, the babies are, it's easy, plain, and simple for them. That's why they run in the street. They don't think, oh, cars. They don't think like that. Why? They're unaware. They're babies. Let them get a little bit more mature, a little bit older, and guess what young kids do? They start to look both ways before they cross the street. They know at least that, you know what? These cars can hurt me. I'm aware of them now. And so the more we begin to grow, the more we begin to see the subtleties and the dangers that confront us. Last week, for example, now that I started this, man, I had probably one of the worst weeks of my life. And then I, I, I started to complain to the Lord in my quiet time. And here's the thought that flooded my mind. You really think? that you were going to get away this week without any conflict, and you're talking about the arch enemy that hustles you, that you're a target of? And I went, you know what? I get it, God. I get it. So now I got to be extra heads up this week and the weeks to come. And you know how I'm doing it? I expect the warfare. Wow, is Satan going to come up and do battle with my sword? And it's going to be like, you know, Star Wars? Not like that. He's going to use flesh and blood. It's going to use people. But I have to look at the person and know, ah, I got this. He's not really the person. He's doing the action, but it's what's behind him 
that the thinking and the spirit realm that's operating to make the person do what he's doing or make her do what she is doing. That's what we got to be heads up against. So, exactly the same thing in spiritual life that it is in the physical life in a battle. The more you grow, the more mature you get, the sharper you become. That's what we want to do. And you can do it today. We want to be Christians that know the word and can think and start looking at the ways in which the warfare is being presented to us so that we can fight back, hold our ground. Number two, it's Roman numeral one, numerical number two. I'm going to go slow with this. The person who realizes their own weakness The person who realizes their own weakness and the power of the devil realizes their need for protection. Give it to you again. The person who realizes their own weakness and the power of the devil realizes their need for protection. You give me a Christian that realizes where they're weak realizes that the devil is strong, that his schemes are many, that he's a hustler and he's good at it. I mean, look, if you can hustle at him without a sin nature, that takes a lot of juice. If he can do that and we have a sin nature, look out. Takes us to Roman numeral two. Jesus realized your need for protection and my need for protection. We see it in John 17 under... Under 2a, Roman numeral 2, verse a, this prayer demonstrates it. I mean, think about it. He's ready to go to the cross, and he's concerned and warning his disciples because he saw it coming. It's so big that while he's under the shadow of the cross, he feels a burden to pray for the 12. And if you look at the verb tense, it's also for those that come after the 12, Ergo, you and I. He saw exactly what was going to take place. And so he pleads with the Father, look, I kept him, I protected him, I'm going to the cross now to fulfill your plan, Father. Now you keep him and you protect him till I finish this thing. And we have three things that he saw. So let me give them to you under here. Number one, He saw the forces ready to attack them, the 12. He saw it coming, and they were coming. He saw the forces ready to attack the 12. Number two, he particularizes these these forces. They're particular, and he lists them. He particularizes these forces. So let me give them to you. And the first one is huge, and we never hear much about it. Under A, 2A, the world itself is the first one. The world itself is the first one. From verses 11 through 15, every verse has the word world mentioned. That better tell you and I, we better be heads up and find out what he's talking about. He puts it in every single verse from 11 through 15. Why? Because the disciples are in the world, like you and I. We can't escape this world yet until we die. We're in it. He saw the forces coming, so he wants us to be prepared to be able to do battle. But that word world, The Greek has three words that are translated into the English world. The first one is the universe. That's not the word he chooses here. Okay? And the second one means we get like, let me use the verse, for God so loved the world. You know that verse, John 3, 16, that he gave his only begotten son. That word, translated world in the English, is the Greek word 
cosmos, which means humanity. So now you plug it in. For God so loved humanity that he gave his only begotten son. We're celebrating Easter. See it? He loved mankind. But that's not the word either. The word that is used here in our text means a worldview, a way of thinking. So what Jesus saw is a secular world view that left God out and man at the center of it. That's the first thing that we need to look at. It's the way, you have a small b in your outline, it's the way the world thinks, the way the world has its values. I mean, you see it all over today. You, you, one of the latest things that is going on now, you know, which is amazing to me, and I just saw it, it's on a website. CNN's got it on. Maybe they'll pull it, but it states this, that you cannot tell the sex of a baby that's born. Really? So you don't know what sex the baby is. Now, how about them apples? I guess you don't know. Your parents may have mis misnamed you if they named you and you are a boy and you had organs that are male and you found out later you wanted to be a girl. You see the idea? Where does that come from? I mean, the science, this is biology. And, and yet you're getting rid of that. See the world system? It's a way of thinking. But where did this come from? It's taught in Ivy League schools. Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Stanford, Brown University. And so they're teaching kids, so now kids are walking around with this idea. It's not coincidental. It's a way of thinking that dominates our world system today. And it's in every facet of it. Even in the area of theology where people debate whether or not God exists, whether or not truth exists in philosophy. Here's what's interesting. The worldview today that is secular states that truth is not absolute. There is no absolute standard. So now what man does, he makes up different standards. Truth is relative. You hear that all the time. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, I am the truth. Not that he just speaks truth. He says, I am the embodiment of truth. I'm the standard. That's what he's saying. See the difference in worldviews? A biblical, theistic worldview has God at the center. A secular worldview has God out. Man decides what truth is. And that's what we have today. That's what we're battling with. And so... That's the first element that we see. What did John say about this? Love not the world. He's not talking about the universe, and he's not talking about man. He's talking about love not the world system, neither the things that are in it. In other words, don't get hung up on how they see things. Don't love that. Why? Because that's Satan's baby. He's the God of this world. He promotes that. And it's always contrary to Scripture, contrary to God. The third thing that we want to see, and I just gave it to you, small c, Satan, the God of this world. Need to be heads up about it. You don't hear a lot of talk about it, but he is alive and well, and he works his stuff. All you got to do is look at our society today, look at the culture, look at the way people think and the ideas, and you should see it. Roman numeral three, the cross proclaims all are lost. The very day that we're celebrating, Easter Sunday, does one thing. It screams to humanity. You ready? That man has a problem with God. Think about that. The cross screams a message from God that man is really messed up when it comes to his lack of relationship with the true and living God. How do we know that? Under A, let's take a look. 
The blood of Christ condemns. The blood of Christ condemns, and humanity hates condemnation. I gave it to you again. The blood of Christ condemns. How do we know that? We know in the Old Testament that life is in the blood. There is no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. So if there needs to be shedding of blood, it's a condemnation on humanity. And the second part of A, and humanity hates condemnation. You ever notice that everybody says, I'm a good person. I mean, nobody likes, I don't like being condemned. But what it illustrates, the blood itself illustrates that man is inadequate, that he can't fix himself, that there's a sense of failure, that humanity is in trouble. And guess what? When you have a secular worldview where man becomes God, if you will, at the center of it, he hates all of this. He does not like the fact. And what is the problem with man? It's a pandemic. If you want to, now that everybody is geeked up on COVID-19, it is worse than that. And we have it under A1. Man is a sinner. And the world hates Christ for that. Man is a sinner. And the world hates hates Christ for that and hates his followers, you and I. So the world and its worldview is not going to like you. I mean, you start to start to push back a little bit and then you get the ad hominem argument and this drives me up a wall. Here's what happens when you want to debate somebody. You deal with the issues. What the world does is when you start to box them in a corner with truth, then they call you names. Oh, like you're homophobic. You're racist. Xenophobic. That's not arguing. It's called an ad hominem argument in law. It means you start to attack the person because you don't have the facts to deal with the subject matter. And you see it all the time. Look for it when you go out this week. When you watch people on TV, when there's a debate going on, the person that's going to is losing the debate will then switch and start attacking the individual instead of dealing with the facts. That's what we want to deal with, the facts. So John 17, 14, let me give you the proof text to show that the world is going to hate God, Christ, and you and I as his followers. John 17, verse 14, one of our verses. Here's what Jesus says. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. For they are not of the world. See, they're not of the same thinking. That's what he's saying. They don't have the worldview. They have a biblical worldview where God is first. And he's saying that they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. But the world hates you and I, so get used to it. So if you're a preacher and you're preaching and the world loves you, I can guarantee you it's not gospel. Something else. You start preaching this and call men and women sinners, they're not going to like it. It sort of reminds me of I got invited. This is really interesting. I got invited to speak at Cal State Dominguez Hills at a philosophy class. So the place is packed. They said they're bringing in a minister. So you know what that means. You know, let's roast them, right? And so I go in the classroom, get ready to start the lecture. I'll never forget it. And I said, you know, the problem with humanity, I said, do you think you're by nature good or by nature bad in this class? Everybody said they're by nature good. Really? I said, so... You're just prone to do good things, to think good thoughts, to never think selfish thoughts, to never do things that you know are wrong. I said, well, the Bible says that we're all sinners. You would have thought, you would have thought I called them some sort of names because the place erupted. 
And then they said, and I'll never forget this, they said, well, that's your opinion. What's good for you is good for you, and what's good for me is good for me, they said. So now we're going to get wordy with the philosophical mumble-jumble. Never forget it. Guy's sitting in the front. So I said, I stopped in the middle. I went, Rolex? And he went, yeah. I said, can I see it? And so he gave it to me. It was nice, 30 grand. So I put it on. Went back to the lecture. When I was done, the guy in the front row raised his hand and said, hey, hey, my watch. I said, well, hey, homie, didn't, weren't you the dude that said, you know, we all have our truth. What's good for me is good for me, and what's good for you is good for you. Well, guess what? I like the watch. I'm going to keep it. Situational truth. Are you not, cons- are you suggesting that I'm stealing? Are you telling me that it's yours and that I can't take it? That there's an absolute truth here? And it got so quiet in the room. I said, yeah, that's what you're telling me. So you don't really believe the stuff that you're saying. Do you know when I left? Do you know what they asked the teacher? Bring the guy back. See, that's what we have to be ready to do as believers. Expose the falsehood with the truth. All right, so let me give you a biblical example of this now. First century Christians, watch the pushback here. They become Christians, and here's what happens. The Jews come after them. In fact, the Jews lead the charge to crucify Christ. And guess what? 2020, we got the same issue today. The world is right there at us trying to do whatever they can do, like no Ten Commandments in the legal judicial system. Don't put them on there. Definitely can't put them in a public school. No prayer. Church and state is separate. You know how we got education? came from Judeo-Christian background. It came from believers. So, you start to see it today. The good thing about the gospel, though, is man is a sinner. All have sinned. Nobody's perfect. You do have a problem, like it or not, and God has given you and I an answer. His son, who deals with the problem, sin, and it costs you Nothing but the willingness to acknowledge that Christ is the Son of God who came to die on the cross for you and your sin, and God raised him on the third day that you might have eternal life. That's all it takes is trust on your part, and you become a new person. Which leads us to Roman numeral 4, and we're done. The cross also proclaims redemption, that you become different. You can become new. You can become perfect? No. But you become new in Christ. You have eternal life. You have heaven waiting for you. You have a relationship with the creator of the universe that created over a billion stars who made you and I, who gave you life through his spirit, and will take you home when you die. Take a look at something really interesting. This really intrigued me, especially for an Easter message. I know you're not getting the traditional one, but that's okay. Uh, Mark chapter 15 and Luke, I mean, uh, 1531. Matthew, Mark, right before Luke, 15. 31. I want you to catch something here. What I really like doing is taking unsaved people and using what they say against them to look at a principle that is biblically true. So let's take a look. Mark 15, verse 31. Let me read it for you. It says, in the same way the chief priests, these are the preachers now, okay? The ones that know the Old Testament. 
the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him, that's Christ, among themselves. Look what they say. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. I see. He's on the cross, and they make a comment. He saved others, but he can't save himself. Under A1, we have a principle to look at, so let me give it to you. The master principle of redemption. And I'm going to go real slow here because you got a nugget. The master principle of redemption. Under 1A, if Christ is to save others, I really want you to get this, so I'm going to go slow. If you don't get it, raise your hand. I'll repeat it. If Christ is to save others, he cannot save himself. Let me repeat it. If Christ is to save others, he cannot save himself. In other words, if he saved himself, which he could have done, he said it. I can call angels here and handle this thing. If he saved himself, he could not have saved other people. I'm wondering how these priests and teachers and experts in the law couldn't see that. It means they don't know the word. The Messiah becomes the sacrifice for humanity. He can't sacrifice himself and save himself. And these guys didn't get it. These self-blinded priests and scribes mistakenly supposed that Christ's apparent inability to save himself proved that he cannot be the Savior of others. Huh? Huh? That's just the opposite, whereas the very opposite is the case with him. He, his becoming the Savior of others, depended on him not saving himself so he could die and offer the perfect sacrifice that is unblemished without sin. It was the exact type of the Old Testament process of getting rid of sin. Only now, it's not an animal, it's a human. All God and all man, God's son. Number two, numerical two. It was in order to save that he lived and died and rose again. It was in order to save that he lived, that he died, and that he rose again. Now I want to go back to these priests and these experts because they made a big comment. And, you know, I never thought about this until this week. The end of verse 31, he saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. His crucifiers, unbelievers, confessed a truth. I want you to see it. What is the truth? Here's what they said. He saved others. The reading in the Greek in verse 31b that we just read in the English says, he has saved others. They're admitting it. How about them apples? Unsaved people admitting. The preachers, the experts in the Old Testament, the ones that supposedly know it and don't are admitting that he saved folks. Wow, you don't even need Christians to affirm that. Now, let me ask you, who'd he save? They said he saved others. Who are the others? That's what I had to ask myself. They heard it and they saw it. I'm just going to go right down the list real quick and we're done. In Mark 5... You had the demon-possessed man in the tombs. This guy was a beast. The Bible says in Mark 5 that he had legions of demons in him. The Roman army had a legion. It's 64 men. This is plural, legions. That's a lot of demons. He was out in the city in the tombs. Nobody wanted any part of this guy and the Son of God. Heals him. 
demons gone. They heard about it. That's big news. Saved them. Became normal. And then you have, in Mark 5, the girl, Jairus' uh, daughter, the Roman, who's dead. Now, catch this trust. They go to Jesus and they go, you know what? My daughter's dead now. He gets word. He's going to Jesus saying, come, my daughter's dying. I know you can heal her. I know you can save her. And then word comes to the centurion and says, your daughter's dead. And you know what he says? All you got to do is say it. It'll happen. This is a Gentile, not raised in church. And Jesus goes, man, I haven't seen faith like this. You don't think these priests heard about it? No, they did. And then in Mark 2, you have the paralytic, the guy that can't walk. Now, I want you to see what happens. Dead girl raised to life. Demons exercise. Paralytic that can't walk, healed, saved. Mark 1, leper, cleansed. Look at these because every one of these are not willy-nilly. They're evidence from the Old Testament that the Messiah would come and handle these issues. It was a testimony that Jesus is the very God in the flesh. That's what it's showing. You get leprosy in that time, it's a death sentence. What does he do? Heals them. Saves them. Then you have John 9. This is funny. You can go home tonight and read that chapter. You got a guy born blind. And now these preachers want to investigate and talk to the guy because now he can see. And so they're coming up with all these spins and then gee, the guy, I love it. I wish I was sitting there. The guy goes, you can say whatever you all want to say. All I know is this. I'm paraphrasing it. I was blind. Now I see. And it's him that did it. Healed me. Saved me. Uh, these preachers heard about it. They didn't like it. But the one that hits me and the one I'm going to close with is Matthew 26, verse 7. It was a woman. She had a lot of sin in her life. A lot. You probably know her by the by the alabaster jar, years worth of wages put in a jar. So when she sees Jesus, catch this now, she takes out a year's worth of wages, breaks it, and anoints him. You know what I found out about that lady? She was a prostitute. A lot of sin, but a lot of love for the Savior. Why? He healed her spiritually. He saved her. And then we have you and me. He's still saving today. Millions have become believers. So I have one question to ask you as I close. How have you and I moved the heart of God? This woman did it. And you know what Jesus said about her? They're never going to forget you. They're going to talk about you. And so now 
I'm looking at my life. You can look at your life. And like the lady with the alabaster jar, how do we move God's heart? I can think of a couple of things you and I can do. One, if you're in a trial today and you're a believer, wait, trust him. Know that he abides with you. Don't move. Let him go to work for you. You know what Jesus said when they brought Lazarus? And he said, for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there. What? That's what the verse says. He says, for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there when Lazarus was sick. And what did they do? They ran up to him and said, if you were there, he wouldn't have died. And he turns around and goes, I'm glad I wasn't. Why? Because trials allow God to work. So if you're in a trial today, stay there. Don't run. Trust this guy who's the God of heaven and earth. And that will demonstrate huge worship of him. More than singing on Sunday. Because some of you have been in trials, and they may last a month, two months, five years, ten years. You're still in it. You're still battling it. Some of you have unanswered prayer, and it's been 10, 15 years. Don't quit. If God wants to answer it, he'll answer it. If it's not now, you trust him. And you know what you're doing? You're worshiping. That'll move his heart. That'll let him know that you love him. So, as we close today, for Easter Sunday, think about it this week. What do you and I do to move our Savior's heart? Let's pray. Father, if there are any that are listening, they don't know you. They can bow their hearts and admit to you that they're sinners. They're selfish. They're self-centered. You have never been a part of their life, and now they want the forgiveness of sin. They want to be clean, like the prostitute. Want to be wiped clean of a burden of guilt for a life of doing things that they know were wrong. And thank you, God, that if they come to you and, and just say, Lord, I'm a sinner that, and I'm asking you to forgive me for my sin and come into my heart and make me the man or woman you've called me to become, you've done it. Why? Because you rose from the dead, which demonstrates God's approval of the sacrifice. If they just do that, they'll be born from above, new in Christ. And for those of us that are already believers, Father, I pray that we know the transforming power of the resurrection in our hearts. That we begin to get a taste of it in our day-to-day -day life. And we really have a connection with the reality of being born from above. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for answering the prayer that we asked in the beginning and demonstrating your power spiritually through the very book of life, Spirit, the Word. Now, as we march through the rest of this year, may we move your heart, Father, by the love that we have for you, no matter what. Come what may, as you see, we are trusting you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to move into uh, communion. So as we take a brief moment, let me step down. We'll handle this. We'll be done. All right, as we prepare for communion, you know our policy um, here at Benaya that um, before we start, I'm going to ask you, to take spiritual inventory of your life. We're going to let the Holy Spirit sort of run through what we've been through this past week. 
and ask him, is there anything that you need to confess to him privately and personally? Whether it's something that you should have done and he's urged you to do it and you didn't do it and you know that he was nudging you to do it or um, something you shouldn't have done and you did it. Uh, so we want to take a few moments. Whatever he brings to your mind, that's the time for you to confess it. Time for you to admit to Christ that you did this particular action. You be specific with him. And then we'll wait about uh, just a, a few moments. And then I'll pray for both elements. We'll take communion and we'll be done. Okay, so for the next, say, 30 seconds here, let's uh, ask the Holy Spirit to sort of rewind this past week, this past month. Whatever he brings to your mind, you confess it. And then I'll close it with a prayer for myself and you, and then we'll take communion. So shall we pray? And ask the Holy Spirit again to bring to your mind what you need to share with him. Father, well, humans are crazy. You know, we, we, are, we are so self-centered that even in a moment like this, we may fight in our flesh to not confess certain things. But yet, we know that if we do so, that we have forgiveness for it. And if we do so, then the fellowship with you that sin breaks, is restored. And that's what we want. We want to have and allow the Holy Spirit to have the freedom in our life moment by moment that we can hear you as a result of a clear connection. We know that sin gives us static like on a phone and we can't hear you. So, Father, thank you for allowing us to have the privilege for what you did on the cross that allows humanity to come to your dad and to you and say, you know what, I did this, forgive me. Or I should have done this that you were asking me to do, forgive me. And the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, you are faithful and just to forgive us for our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, you know what, Father, it feels good to be clean. No therapy can do it. No psychiatrist can give it. No counselor can handle it. Only the living God. And so we praise you and thank you that for the believer, every day is Easter. But we're celebrating it today. Help us to reflect on what you had to go through, that we might have the privilege to do what we just did. And we thank you for it. Now we're going to ask you to bless the elements, bless the bread, bless the, 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 the cup. You said to do it in remembrance of you, to do it, to take our mind back to what you actually did for us in A.D. 33. And you said to do it until you come. So that's what we're doing now, Lord. Thank you for the privilege to partake. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is to take the, the bread 
Jesus said that as in the Last Supper, that as he had the bread and he broke it and he passed it around, he said that it would be symbolic of his body that would be given up for him. John said it, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. God gave his one and only in John 3, 16. And so as we take the bread, let's reflect on the body of Christ what he handled, the pain he endured, and the spiritual, emotional stress that it entailed. Shall we take the bread? And then he took the cup of wine, and he passed it among the group, and he said that it would be symbolic and represent the shedding of blood. The Bible says that there's no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. And the only once and for all sacrifice had to be human. Animals, you saw what happened with animals in the Old Testament. They had to keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it. And then God, in his plan, gave his one and only son to live and to die and raised him again, demonstrating by the resurrection that the sacrifice was sufficient for man's sin. His blood. Life is in the blood. Jesus said, when you do it, do it in remembrance of me. Shall we take the cup? Now, don't be solemn. It's a good day. You are one of the few that it made through the gate that is narrow. Wide is the gate to destruction. The challenge for us now in the next days and weeks to come, is to be the warrior. Be heads up for the warfare. Know it's coming. Know you're in it. And let's see if we can begin to catch what God wants us to be aware of. Part two, next Sunday. God bless you all. Have a great week.